It's time to have some more fun with season three of The Expanse. Hello, hello, welcome back to my channel. This is Asha Media TV. Welcome, welcome. My name is Asha. This is where I like to watch and react and review a variety of stuff related to sci-fi, fantasy, and comic books. So in today's video, I am going to be watching and reacting to seven videos related to behind the scenes, um, also fan-made videos <laughs> related to season three of The Expanse. But before I get to pressing play on any of these videos, let me make a few things clear, especially if you're new here. Please don't skip ahead, listen up. Number one, just in case you missed it in the title, there are spoilers ahead related to season three and possibly seasons one and two. So if you haven't watched anything related to The Expanse up until the end of season three, spoilers ahead, you have been warned. And lastly, just for the sake of consistency with what I've established in the comment section with my channel so far related to my reactions to The Expanse, if you're going to leave a comment, please start it off with no spoilers followed by your comment. Otherwise, I'm going to skip over your comment and I'll miss out on whatever insightful piece of information you want to share with me related to season three and no other seasons afterwards, right? Okay, so I've covered the basics with any of you new to my channel. I am going to get ready now to press play on these videos found on YouTube. Links to all of these videos will be in the description box for you. And yeah, let's get going. Hello. Okay, I'm ready to press play on my first video, which is the longest one. So with that in mind, timestamps are in the description box so you can skip wherever you want, okay? And you'll know which one to skip to. Uh, so this one is The Expanse Season 3 Explained. I felt that was fitting to start with because, uh, yeah, Season 3 does a lot to explain to me. And, uh, yeah, I think that's enough said right there. So this is the longest one. It's from Jake's Place. That's the channel I have retrieved this video from. Again, links in the description. I won't repeat that. Okay, you should know, should be standard for you to know that. So, let's go. I love the warning at the beginning. The following clip may contain language and themes unsuitable for young audiences. Yeah, okay. Ready? Let's go. Three, two, one, play. <laughs> Mostly science and fiction. So that's Jake. Well, before we kick off, I just want to remind everyone that The Expanse was cancelled by sci-fi because they are morons. But good news, everyone! It was picked up by Amazon, so we will be getting a season four. Yes. If you want a season two recap, check out my season two recap video. Which I did Link watch. in the description. Obviously, in this video, there will be spoilers for the entire three seasons of The Expanse. I shouldn't have to say that, but I got a few complaints last time I made one of these. I will be drawing a bit from my book knowledge as I have read them all, but as the TV show and the books don't line up exactly there will be some things i can't totally explain without giving away a possible i'd like to read the books the but this will be a massive recap I so, so much on my list to read in the description if you want to jump to any section all right here we go season three of the expanse is broken up into two halves with a significant time gap in between the first half is very convoluted so i have broken it up into three arcs okay. arc one the rossi crew here we have tension between the gang and naomi as in season two she went behind their backs with the proto molecule prax and the search for may concludes dr Str Strickland, Jules, Pierre, Mao, and the proto monsters are explained. Avasarala and Bobby join the Rossi crew. Yeah, yeah. Uh, put Avasarala and Bobby in both arcs. That arc sums it up really well. As they are thick in both storylines. Arc two. Politics, war between mm. Earth and Mars. Corrupt politicians, Avasarala and Bobby are on the run. We get the introduction to the Reverend Anna Volovodov. There's a mutiny on the Agatha King. Although this takes place on the other side of the solar system, this directly relates to Savadir Ehrenreich. Arc 3, the Belters. Only a small amount of screen time in the first half, but significant in the second. We mm. have the salvage of the Navu and outfitting it into a warship. Drummer is made captain. Again, that's more of a second half thing. And we have the new Belter Navy, which again is more of a second half thing as well well. Let's start with Arc 1. Holden is committed to find Prax's daughter May. Naomi says that they should instead seek refuge at Tycho Station, but no one cares what she says anymore because she went behind the back of the crew. 
They learn via the detection of a protomolecule <laughs> signal that may could be on Io, a moon of Jupiter. Io is home to research facilities and provides power cells to the belt. We the viewers know that Mal has a secret lab here headed by Dr. Strickland, former child's physician and current mad scientist. <laughs> and he's doing horrible scientist. experiments on the children with Indeed. a rare Maya skeleton premature immunosenescence disease and turning them into the protomolecule monster soldiers we saw last season. Strickland has limited protomolecule samples, so only experiments on one kid at a time. Good news for Prax is that May hasn't been infected with the protomolecule as yet. Upon visiting the labs, Mal catches a glimpse of his dead daughter with Yucky coming out of her on a monitor <laughs> and yucky. sees similarities between his Julie and Prax's daughter May. He then demands they shut down the whole operation, stating that we are torturing children, basically. Which, yes, yeah, they are. He then stumbles into a lab where Strickland was hiding a protomolecule child who has mutated quite significantly, Katoa, and here he learns that the subject is communicating with the protomolecule on Venus in real time. This tells us that on some unknown sub-level of the cosmos or something that the protomolecule can communicate in real time across great distances. This is an incredible astronomical discovery and Mao, blown away by it and Strickland's work, retracts his order to shut down the research and demands it continues. Sick bastard. <laughs> on the way to Io, the gang picks up Abasarala and Bobby the babe. God, she's a fucking fine. Anyway, they become temporary guests on the Rossi. She they escape from our ship by a dead Julie's race ship and end up getting chased and fired upon by a UN vessel. Unfortunately, Coita, Avasarala's loyal manservant, Coita. couldn't go with them. This is all due to the bastard man, Savadir Ehrenreit, but more on that in a bit. Oh yeah, to hide their identity, the Rossi changed its ID to the Penis Contorta. Some kind of fire plant. Avasarala has a secret message that she discovered on Mao's ship. This message shows <laughs> Eren Wright threatening Mao and incriminating himself, saying he gave the order to fire first above Ganymede, which started the war. This proves that Earth started the war, not Mars. Mars was simply defending itself, and Avasarala, who was framed by Eren Wright blaming her for the Eros incident, is actually innocent. After saving Bobby and Avasarala, the gang scavenges for a resupply and ends up with some Martian guests. The Martians try to retake the ship, but to no avail. The gang tells the Martians to deliver the message to Admiral Souther, who Avasarala believes to be an honorable man. On the way to it Io, Naomi confesses man. that she has a son, or had a son, and her ex took him away from her. She can't help but imagine her boy out and about in the belt somewhere, which is why her belt to loyalties have been coming back lately. She can't hide her feelings anymore, and she's torn up inside from losing her son long ago. A son she will likely never see again, see him grow up, nor share will she? With. It's truly heartbreaking. Why would they bring stuff. it up? Orton unless... can't forgive her for betraying I mean, the we'll game, see. but understands her point of view. I mean, this holding guy, what a fucking legend, what a dreamboat, what a man. Not as manly as Amos, though. Amos, more like <laughs> Amos. Mm -mm. If I was that way inclined, I'd be all over that stud muffin. All right, yeah. on to arc two. Politics. He's more of a paper so, bag for me. while all this is happening, war is breaking out due to a who shot first situation over Ganymede. Really, what happened was a secret weapons test of the protomolecule monsters that we learned about in season two. So, Aaron Wright makes a deal with Mao. He will give Mao full immunity if Mao gives him the secret proto weapons. So, Savadir Aaron Wright, being the corrupt poopy man that he is, was just itching poopy for this man. war and was pulling the strings to make it happen by dealing illegally with Jules Pierre Mao, who, as we know, is an illegal arms dealer and is paying Strickland to develop the mutant killer monster babies. But why Aaron Wright do this? His motives are quite <laughs> so straightforward. Cute. He hates Mars and wants them eliminated. He organizes a preemptive strike against Mars's first strike ships. The Secretary General of the UN, Gillis, basically the leader of Earth, like the President of Earth, more or less, signs off, honestly believing it to be the best move to save Earth lives and end the war, perhaps. But really, he was coaxed into it by Aaron Wright. They fire rail guns, but due to an electrical malfunction, one gun fires late and Mars gets off one missile before it's destroyed. The nuke detonates in South America and almost two million people are killed. Whoops. Just before this, we meet Anna. She's a reverend and an ex-political speechwriter and a bunch of other things. Gillis hired her to help write a winning speech for him. After the nuke incident, she writes him a great speech about making peace with Mars. Aaron Wright corrupts the ending of this speech with his input and makes it a declaration of war. Mars must be conquered, so saith Earth. 
Anna is pissed. <laughs> the crew also sends That's an well. incriminating message you edit to that well. But more on that in a bit. Kotya, or however you say his name, the most loyal Kotya, subject ever, ends up a prisoner on the UN ship, the Agatha King, captained by Admiral Souther, but not before brutally killing this guy. He did this so he doesn't give up Abbasarala. However, Souther is soon relieved of command by Fleet Admiral Nguyen, who is being paid off by Aaron Wright and is being a total knob rocket about it too. <laughs> on the Agatha King, loyalist to Souther informs Souther that Nguyen has has been sending and receiving secret messages from the UN. We learn that he's in the pocket of Aaron Wright. But why is Nguyen, a flippin' fleet admiral, in the pocket of Aaron Wright? Well, not only did Aaron Wright supposedly help him ascend through the ranks, he also hates the Martians as well, and probably believes oh, that Aaron Wright is the man to deal with the Martians the way he would, with extreme prejudice. Admiral Nguyen reroutes his ship to Io, the UN fleet follows, and the Mars fleet follows after that. Southo, Southo, whatever his bloody name is, gets the message sent from Sandrin Karana. Well, how do you say her name? Jesus, I'm bad with names. She's the captain of the Martian <laughs> ship, the Hambarabi. <laughs> Hambarabi! Hambarabi. This was the message that the Rossi crew gave to the Martians to give to whomever to give to Souther. But Souther isn't 100% convinced that the message is legit. He needs to prove that it's real. So he That's a good picture. To Katia, he has Katia, good Katia, choices Katia, of freeze Katia, frames. Who confirms the message is legit by double checking or proof checking his story against Koita's story. The Martian ship has a firing solution on the Agatha King, but in Instead of firing, Karina says this amazing quote, War is an inherently unstable interaction of three things, intense emotion, politics, and love. Triple so instead of firing on the Agatha King, Karina waits to see if Souther will deal with the corruption and, you know, stand down, basically. Souther starts a mutiny against the corrupt Nguyen, stating that Nguyen has conspired to wage an illegal war and that he can prove it. Souther sends a wide beam transmission to all ships, both fleets, Earth and Mars, stating that he is standing down. Oh shit breaks loose man, Nguyen shoots Souther dead, bang bang. The Nguyen fleet is divided. Many crew on the Agatha <laughs> so King well refuse orders and are taken to the brig. Nguyen then fires on his own ship that he says was deserting. Shit breaks loose again! And the UN ships start firing on each other. Nguyen gets shot in the guts blah, 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 while trying to suppress the <laughs> mutiny. Shit just got real. But it's about to get even realer. Evil Nguyen, who was previously given fire control of the hybrid monster pods by Mao, basically they are missile pods with the monsters in them that are used to transport the, the beasts to planets or whatever. Nguyen fires them all off as a last desperate attempt and to say, fuck you, to Mars. The Rossi gang That's now on Io tries to you. shoot them down, as do some of the remaining ships. But the pods go stealth, so a lot of them make it past the blockade. One of them smashes into the Agatha King and starts infecting everyone. Oh no! Just quickly in Arc 3, the Belters, who are staying well away from all this, have reclaimed the wayward Mormon ship, the Nauvoo, and have started retrofitting it, turning it into the Belters' first warship, and in fact, the biggest warship ever made. Problem is, as we learn later, that the retrofit is more for show, as the Mormon Earth ship, if you will, was never meant for war and is basically a giant tin can with a few guns strapped to it. It would be pretty ineffective in an actual battle, but it proves to be a good symbol for the belt and the display of belt of pride, engineering, and ingenuity. But more on that in a bit. So let's go back to Arc 1. Holden and the gang infiltrate the secret base just as Prax's daughter Mame is about to be infected. Talk about timing! Mm -hmm. They smash everyone, of course, and then try to find a way to stop the hybrid prods, reasoning that they were launched from here so they can be unlaunched from here, only to discover that controls were given to Nguyen on the Agatha King. What a poo and a pillow. Remember, the Agatha <laughs> King is all proto yucky. Like Alex and Naomi board the ray ship and head to the Agatha King to try to stop the hybrid bombs. Here they see the proto molecule adapting and taking over the ship. Previously, we only knew that it could mutate organic matter, not inanimate stuff. Well, kinda. Alex remarks that after taking apart a few ships, it may have learned a thing or two. The proto molecule is learning. Perhaps it even has an objective. Ooh. <laughs> they dock and make their way into the CIC where they find the wounded Nguyen. Naomi starts to reset the course of the hybrid pods while Nguyen prattles on with bigotry. Meanwhile, Koitia, being the loyal legend he is, starts to trigger a core overload in the ship, hoping to destroy the proto molecule. Naomi, unable to redirect all the pods in time, transfers the transponder codes to the Rossi and flees with Alex. The Agatha King explodes, killing Nguyen and the loyal hero, Koitia. 
R.I.P. Koitia I love this guy. What a ledge. However, even with the codes, the gang can't stop all the pods in time, but they can track them, so Naomi suggests sending the codes to Fred Johnson on Tycho, as the proto-rockets will be passing that way on their way to detonate on Mars. The group doesn't like the idea of potentially giving Fred and the belt another weapon, but it's either this or the war continues and basically Mars will be completely wiped out. Besides, Fred already has a proto-molecule sample. They just hope that Fred does the honor I just realized we barely saw Fred this season that them. much. Fred does. He shoots them down and Mars is saved. Hurrah! Hurrah, I say! Holden finds Mal trying to escape with all the research and takes him back to the ship to face Abyssarala. Bobby, the dream machine, gets in a spot of bother when a proto-monster, formerly Katoa, attacks her and messes her up real good. But Bobby, being the gun show that she is, blows the shit out of the proto-molecule's head. <laughs> a second showdown with a proto-monster and again she lives to fight another day. Mm -hmm. Marry me. Prax is reunited <laughs> with May and then wants to kill Strickland for all the terrible things that he's done but just can't bring himself to do it. He's just not a killer. Fortunately, Amos is. What a beast. If you have read the books, there is a great short story that tells of Amos's past and how he became the ruthless blunt object that he is today. I don't know if they will adapt this into future episodes so I won't say much more on this but having read that novella, it sure puts this scene into perspective. Oh. Just just read the books. They complement the show. Like it's a so whole much. book about right, Amos? Back to Arc Anna shows the incriminating video to the Secretary General and Gillis arrests Aaron Wright for treason. So Mars is safe, thanks to Holden and the gang. Prax and his daughter are safe. <laughs> Mao and Aaron Wright are arrested. Bobby is safe and as beautiful as ever. War is averted, at least for the moment, and everything is going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, right. A massive space fairy vessel of some kind has been launched by the proto molecule from Venus. What are its intentions? And where is it going? Let's find out. So this takes us into the second half. I suggest taking a short break to grab a cup of tea, maybe a beer and a sandwich, stretch your legs, do some chin-ups, then strap in. Because although this second half is not as busy as the first half, it gets a hell of a lot more surreal and far more sci-fi-y. So here everything comes together, so I will scrap the arc thing and just list the main events. We pick up a few months after the proto-ship has left Venus. The alien ship has created a giant ring of some kind that is in orbit around your anus. <laughs> <laughs> that never gets old. And then 178 days since the formation Futurama, of the Rama, that was, story uh, continues. That was Mao is imprisoned and his accounts and assets are all frozen. Aaron Wright has been arrested for treason. The war between Mars and Earth has ceased. The Secretary General Gillis has retired and Avasarala has taken his place and she promotes peace among the nations. The beautiful Bobby has been reinstated into the Martian Marine Corps. Prax and May are safe back on Ganymede, helping to rebuild it after the war destroyed a bunch of it. We are briefly in introduced yeah. to a slingshot racer and his ship, the e -Care. He was trying to break racing records around Saturn, we saw this back in season 1, but due to the ring being such a big deal, he wasn't getting the attention he needs and his disfaithful gal started banging some other dude. So he plans to make a statement, to win her back, plans to prove he is the real man, okay? by racing through the mysterious ring. All One of the glory. dumbest All things I've ever seen a character city. do on TV. <laughs> yeah, now nah, the ring stopped his ship dead and turned him into human sludge. This act, though, also activated the ring. And this is when shit gets real again. The ring activates and mother flippin' Miller returns. Yeah. Holden is freaking out and scanning himself for the protomolecule, but no traces are to be found. Also, the scan says his brain is fine. There's no sign of stroke or anything, so what he is seeing must be real, right? It must be the protomolecule. We are introduced to Melba, who is actually the daughter of Jules Pierre Mao, Julie's sister. Her real name is Clarissa. Never good enough for her smeg toast father, she blames Holden for everything and plans to humiliate him and then kill him. Also, she can prove to her father her competence and loyalty. I mean, the term daddy issues would be an understatement here. <laughs> she commits an act of terrorism, blowing up a Accurately. UN science vessel, then uses a fake video that shows Holden saying he did this on behalf of the belt. Melba is broken inside. She also has a narcotic stimulant in her teeth. When she wants, she can bite down on it and it releases a powerful performance enhancing drug that gives her increased speed and strength, but it also takes its toll on her. It drains her bit by 
my bit. It's a full, like, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type shit, except everyone is Mr. Hyde in this scenario. <laughs> she is one messed up cookie dough with bugs in it. But with a father like Jules Pierre Mao, I mean, of course she's not right in the brain hole. So the delusional Melba blows up a UN vessel and has the reporter cameraman on the Rossi send the fake footage from the Rossi, which wrongly incriminates Holden. The OPA fires on the Rossi to show they are not a part of whatever James Holden is supposedly trying to do. The Rossi has no choice but to flee through the gate, so they do. Following Miller and thus Holden's advice, the gang slows down their ship so as not to splatter like the Belter Slingshot Racer. Once through the ring, the gang finds themselves in some kind of bubble that slows down anything traveling over a certain speed. At this point, it's about 18,000 kilometers per hour. <laughs> this is the station's defense mechanism. Other ships start to enter the ring, UN, Mars, and the Belter's behemoth. A probe gets sent to the edge of the bubble and tries to penetrate out, but to quote Alex, it blinked out of existence. Their ship is fucked from the reporter who doubled as a spy for Melba. He didn't know he was being a spy spy, but whatever. Their ship is crippled but, <laughs> but still whatever. functioning just. As their comms are down, Amos spaces the reporters. They have gear and will live. The gang hopes they will put in a good word for them. Melba is struggling with her guilt, but presses on regardless. Through a series of flashbacks, we see how Clarissa turned into Melba. The neglect from her father and, and her being desperate for his approval led her down this insane path. She blames Holden for the downfall of her father and seeks revenge to prove to her father she's not a fuck up. Holden puts on an EVA, leaves the Rossi and heads towards the station. Miller shows up and they have a bit of a chat. Miller reveals that he has dialed down the station's defenses. If it wasn't for Miller, they might all be dead. Mars sends in a squad of marines after Holden. Bobby is a part of the squad. Holden and Miller reach the control room inside the station and Miller reveals a data core type thing that might have some answers to what all this alien shit actually is. <laughs> Just as the marines show up, they try to shoot Holden, believing him to be in cahoots with the alien in the protomolecule. The bullets are at a two of a high velocity and they are frozen like Matrix styles. The ship activates defense bot. A grenade is thrown by the Martian. How is he going to describe this? This is when all hell breaks loose. The station realizes that even slow moving projectiles can be deadly and so it changes the rules again. All the ships are suddenly slowed right down. This causes extreme deceleration not unlike the rock hopper ship and many people are splattered. Many people just died all cause of the jarhead with the grenade. <laughs> Holden sticks his hand into the machine and gets a okay. super vision. He I thought he was going to describe the flooring well, differently. Well, actually, mostly just the past. What was, but perhaps what could be. Holden blacks out and Bobby learns that the new speed is 28 meters per second. They take Holden back to their ship where they discover that all ships are being pulled into orbit around the station in the middle of the bubble. Everyone is pretty messed up and all the ships no longer have gravity. Without gravity, wounds can't drain, blood pools and clots. Most of the injured will die unless they get gravity sorted which is pretty impossible due to the station limiting their thrust. Remember, the gravity on the ships is created by thrust, not some magic sci-fi tech we often see in other shows. But that's right, the behemoth has a drum that can spin. The Mormons made it this way to simulate Earth gravity. Melba leaves for the Rossi and finds Naomi there. Alex and Amos are all banged up and so Naomi puts them in a sick bay when Melba attacks. Luckily, Anna followed her over and saves the day by zapping Melba. <laughs> so here is where everything comes together. The grand finale of this season anyway. The alien station employing its defense mechanism has pulled all ships around it, keeping them in a kind of suspended animation. But not really, it's more of a bubble. So you are free to run around and shoot shit and do flips and stuff inside the bubble but once outside of the ship outside of your spaceship the station will stop anything moving over 28 meters per second many ships have docked at the behemoth to allow their wounded to heal in the spin gravity holden is there as well but everyone thinks he's a mental case <laughs> to be fair you would be probably suspicious as well i mean he claims to have spoken to the alien the proto molecule or at the very least the ghost of miller he's also a known troublemaker and blah 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 yeah, people think he's there's a lot against him in the custody also he could potentially still be a terrorist alex naomi amos and anna head to the behemoth too to find Holden. They bring their prisoner Melba, who is then taken into custody as well. She is locked up beside Holden, to which she finds very amusing. <laughs> Anna confronts Melba and gives her some it. sick insight, life knowledge stuff. You can tell Melba is kind of having a change of heart. Maybe she was wrong all along. This is confirmed later when she
she overhears Holden and Naomi talking. Holden tells Naomi that he feels somewhat responsible and it is only he who can save everyone from the proto molecule and the greater danger that lies beyond. Melba overhears their conversation through the prison wall and perhaps starts realizing that Holden is not the monster she deemed him to be. Mm -hmm. Bobby and the Martian squad are also at the behemoth. Bobby, not unlike Naomi, is now currently struggling with her loyalties. Does she stick with Mars or swallow her Martian pride and join Holden and the rebels? Eventually, she sides with Holden and the gang after realizing that all this chain of command shit is garbage and mostly either politically motivated or self-motivated. Drummer is alive but mangled from the waist down. She manages with the help of Naomi to rig up some robot legs. She's in a lot of pain but pushes forwards regardless. With the help of a UN scientist, man, Ashford allows an experiment. They use the behemoth's massive long-range antenna to attempt to send a comms message through the ring. It failed. But then they come up with another idea. They try to set off a bomb, hoping that the photons from the explosion will disrupt whatever energy is keeping all their ships stuck there. This fails, and the station starts to charge up. The station starts to think that they are again a threat, and with some small calculations, the scientist tells Ashford that they have about seven hours before whatever the station is going to do is going to happen. Around here is where we get a bit of an explanation for Holden's visions. Holden says that in his weird vision quest that he saw the past events of the protomolecule station. So I'll just quickly explain what the bubble, the vacuum, the station actually is without giving away future events. The bubble, the big vacuum, is actually like a gap in subspace or whatever. The ring is a portal, a wormhole to this gap. The bubble at one point in time had thousands of wormholes linking to it. So a way to think of it is that the station has opened a waypoint, an airport of sorts, and the thousands of gates lead to thousands of solar systems across the universe. So just like wormhole stuff you see from other sci-fi like Stargate or I was Deep literally going to say Stargate, that's the only thing whatever, I can compare it to. Except that the wormholes, the paths are not direct, they all lead here, and from here, from this station, this airport or substation, this bubble, you can then travel through the other gates. Mm. So this is a hub, a meeting point that connects thousands of systems together. It's pretty sick, but whatever created this, whomever created the proto molecule, is long dead. At least this is what Holden has said. The hyper intelligent species that created the ring network has long died out. We don't yet know why, but we do know that it shut the gates in order to prevent a great evil from wiping it out. Basically, the station would destroy entire solar systems to prevent whatever it was from taking it out. It didn't work. This even bigger alien thing was so powerful that even the species that invented the proto molecule, the ring, the station, and so on could not defeat it. So as a last resort, it shut down the gate system itself. I can't say much more on this without spoiling potential future mm. events, but that's... It's going to be interesting to see that. So with the scientist's data, the obvious ongoings, and Holden's visions, Astrid concludes that the only way to save the solar system is to destroy the gate. So they attempt to do so by enhancing the laser to cut through the ring. He reasons that the solar system destroying thing that Holden was talking about is about to happen to them. Of course we know that Ashford's attempts won't work, and in fact it was because of them in the first place, their disturbance, that the alien station was going to attack them. You see, the station is no longer sentient. The species that created it, as mentioned, was wiped out, or at least long gone. It's just following its prime directive, its program. Programming. So they are all apparently doomed, but with the help of everyone, Amos, Alex, and so on, delaying them, Bobby changing sides, Holden, Naomi, and Drummer messing with the power core, and Holden telling them the solution, that is to shut down their power cores to show the station that they are not a threat, and with Melba in a final attempt at redemption, yeah. one last desperate attempt to redeem herself, they shut down the power cores to all the ships. The station, realizing they are no longer a threat, again, just following its programming, releases its grip on all the ships, and then the amazing happens. Hundreds, thousands, actually, of wormholes start to appear through the cloud, all of which lead to habitable solar systems. Everyone returns to Sol, our solar system. Drummer is still alive and has a drink with old mate. No hard feelings, okay? Anna, being the healer she is, comforts Melba. The Rossi crew is back together with a new member, potentially. Bobby, the goddess. And Avasarala, the new leader of Earth, contemplates something. <laughs> Holden questions what they have done and Miller's influence. He saw something in his visions. He saw the species that created the protomolecule, who created the ring system, the most advanced species imaginable, wiped out, gone, extinct. But what could have done this? Despite this new frontier for humanity, despite this gateway to other worlds, to other stars, to other galaxies, Holden, the hero of humanity, is scared. 
the end. Woo -hoo! <laughs> what a great fucking show. Damn, this show rocks. As I mentioned, we are getting a season four. I cannot wait for that. But if you cannot wait for that, either read the books. They are awesome. They complement the show very well. I skipped over a lot of what happened in this season in an attempt to keep this video as short as possible, but that didn't really work out. So if you have any questions, then leave a comment. I will answer as best I can without spoiling possible future events. If you think I got something wrong, please leave a comment so we can discuss it. Also, if anyone was wondering, the series is now pretty much lined up with the books. The third season more or less ends where the third book ends. But oh, up until okay. the second half of the season, the books in the show were pretty much on point, very similar. There had been a few changes, but none as significant up until now. The second half of the season has shown a huge change. So I was thinking, if you want me to make a books versus show video, comparing and contrasting the two, then please leave a comment saying well, so. And I, I don't know if he ended up making that video, but there. also if you guys like the music played, I'll likely video, uh, check it out once I'm up to date. <laughs> we make cosmic themed electro space rock. I play the guitars and my friend all right. does all these other stuff. I don't know if any of this is relevant anymore. We have a new single coming soon. Okay. And a brand Assuming new that it's not, just it stop out. it. <laughs> all right, that was pretty good. It was pretty good, very good recap. And I love that he broke it up into sections that actually helps me. Um, so I'm definitely, definitely, uh, it's part of my playlist. Um, but a question just ar arose in my head as he was finishing off the, uh, the revelation of the 1300 rings. And um, I think I had this question before, but I never got around to saying it in my takeaway review portion for episode 13. And that was, what if they hadn't taken any action? Like, um, this may seem like a stupid question, but I'm going to say it anyway, okay? So what, I was thinking to myself, okay, what if um, Ashford and that scientist guy, what if they never did anything? What if they all just hung around, wondering to see what would happen? Am I left to presume, as a viewer, that the rings would have showed up anyway? Basically, in a nutshell, if they hadn't powered down at all, and they just hung around, would the rings have shown themselves? Or did it take the action of powering down the all the ships and everything to then trigger the station to open up all those rings? And if that's the case, what would have been the triggering factor to even come to the decision of powering down everything. Would Holden have gotten a clue from Miller to do that? I want. I hope you understand where I'm going with, with, with that question. I don't think it's about relevant anyway. I mean, it's almost one of those, you know, what should have happened, what could have happened, should have, could have, but it doesn't matter. We're going into season four where uh, they're going to be exploring a whole new frontier, right? Okay, on to the next video. All right, we are down to video number two. And this one is titled Adam Savage Talks with the Expanse's Wes Chatham from Adam Savage's Tested Channel. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So this one is 14 minutes and four seconds. Let's watch. Three, two, one. Adam Savage here from Tested. I am on the set of The Expanse and I'm sitting next to Amos, AKA West Chatham. West, how are you, brother? How you doing, brother? It's good to see you. You know, before we start, yeah. I wanna say something. Uh, I, I so much appreciate the love and support that you give the show and like getting to meet you and hang out with you. And I, we, I got to go do one of your panels at Comic-Con yeah. and there's just a, an, a, an energy around you and, and, a, and, a, and a fanship that everybody responds to. So I just, I'm, I'm really glad that you, you look out for us, man. Oh, man. I really do appreciate I, it. I feel so at home and so welcomed here into this big family. You're part of the family. It's super, it is yeah. super much a family. Yeah. Okay, so I'm like, given that when we first met, you guys had, were just in the second season of the show. Right. Now you're shooting the fifth season. So yeah. you've had like four and a half years to get inside. I was told Amos, this was spoiler who was free. already your favorite character it in the books, be. Which yes. is like one of my favorite things right. what, how has it been to spend so much time working inside Amos enormously creatively satisfying being able to spend five years and really working on uh, doing the work and putting together in the churn is a novella that's based off Amos's childhood that has always been the foundation that I worked off of and kind of created the, the the character and now that we're in the season five and we're actually physically going back to visit that 
situ the churn situation as childhood to deal okay, with demons well, from the past. Okay, well now I know season five has it's, in I've store. I've done this much, all this work and everything, so it's it's almost a part of me now. It's like inside of me. Amos's journey in season three strikes me as this set of pennies dropping in his head as he kind of realizes. Well, actually, there's a great David Mamet film called Spartan. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Val Spartan, Kilmer yeah. plays a special forces guy, and at one point. His, a penny drops in him, he realizes he shouldn't just do his job, he needs to understand his job. And somebody uh -huh. else says to him, you're not a plan. You're not a planner, you're a shooter. Uh -huh. And I think in season three, Amos realizes he might not just be a shooter. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about what season four might bring for, for Amos's arc. What's, it, what, what's been interesting with the Rocinante journey is that at first it was, uh, Amos's relationship was really focused on Naomi. And in that stems from his first really important relationship that was Lydia uh, from his childhood. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of transferred to Naomi. And then as the, they've been through what they've been through, he's kind of, uh, his sphere of influence is broadened. And so now it's the rest of the Rasenante, the Rasenante we are now all connected. And he, they're under, in that same place. And so as that goes, his, I mean, as that's kind of developed, he's changed in emotionally in a way that some of the circuits are coming on board. Yeah. And he realizes <laughs> that through it. trauma and through the things that he's been as a childhood that a lot of things has been shut down and ripped off. As you get into season four, you see the circuit starting to, to sure, and, and, it's, and it, it's almost more than he can take. Ah, that must be really okay. exciting as an actor to be able to, to sort of play those. I, I, in the scale that you yes. get to in television. This character, more than anything I've ever done, is endlessly fascinating to me. Um, in each season, you know, I, 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 we're in season five right now, and I still have butterflies in my stomach getting to play this character, and I still, um, I still work as hard today as I did on day one of, like, really trying to get in and understand it. I actually took the churn, and I remember sitting down with, and, and gave it to a psychologist and, like, sit down and really went through and said, if, if this happened to somebody, how does this manifest in physical behavior and mannerisms? And what is the thing, what are the, th how does he interact with people, like, socially? What does that look like? And so, it, I, it, you know, five years into it now, it's, I don't even, it's almost, in, it's just inherent in me. Over this time, you've had also a huge and dedicated fandom, and you've been doing a lot more cons in the last Yeah, I can years. see that. I'm curious about Based on some of the comments I've read. you've gotten on the show from the fans, from the reaction that it's been getting from them. That's a, that's a really good question, because that, this show, I've learned a lot in this show, and it's kind of, and I was, I was mentioning this to you earlier, there's something about the Expanse in the Expanse community. Every person that has came up to me, no matter where I am, it's always been a great conversation. So if somebody comes up and it's like, hey man, I like the show, and I like the Expanse, and then we start, and then I immediately get like, oh, well let's, because you know, I've had such great experiences in talking. And go, being able to go to Comic-Con and with this show, realizing that this is this huge celebration of just stories and things that we all love and we're yeah. coming together to really discuss and, and to dress and to just really celebrate these, these stories. Um, and being a part of that, then you, we now have a connection with the fans and a relationship with this show, unlike anything I've ever done before. And so I, I feel every time we show up, I just have a, an, a, such a sense of gratitude for our fan relationship and connection to the show, and I feel supported. And I know that yeah. they have our back, obviously, yeah. you know, with everything that happened. And so, you know, it's just, it's a really wonderful experience, and I haven't, ex you know, experienced anything like that. Something about the expanse is really, it's just really I incredible. wonder if any fan has uh, asked him to wear high heels cast, for fun for like two seconds. You characters that are also sort of um, archetypes, but not necessarily that slot right into a classic archetype uh, mold. I'm curious what you notice about Amos from the type of fans that gravitate towards him as a character. Well, you know what's really fascinating to me is that because I did the detailed work and tried to be as honest about, like, if, if this real, if this really happened to somebody, what is, how is that going to manifest? How that's going to look? Um, I also had an acting teacher. Uh, I, I had an act also as well as I had an acting teacher that told me uh, her name was Sandra Seacat. She said something that was really interesting to me. She said that everything that Every character that comes to you, it's kind of from a spiritual perspective, but everything that comes to you, there are things that that character is working on and dealing with that is parallel with your own things that you're working and dealing mm -hmm. with. And you, even if you're unaware of it, and so, you know, I don't know what I have in common with yeah. that, you know, what I have in common with Amos, 
But ultimately, I know as honest, as honest and truthfully as I can tell the story and do it, there are people, no matter how subtle the mannerisms or characteristics, people come up to me and say, listen, I, I, understand, I know what Amos is going through, and I had similar situations, wow. and I see that through what you're doing. And I never, I, I, didn't, I didn't do it thinking that anybody would even pick you're up on it. You're putting down signposts. And they pick up every time. Oh. And they say, is this what he's going through? I don't want to talk about it because yeah, then it's like, yeah, yeah. And they say, is this? And I, I'll say, yeah. And they say, you know, this has happened to my brother or this is, you know, whatever. And so there's a, we just, there's a certain kind of connection of being honest about this mental health issue. And yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. That must be very gratifying. I mean, you know, we find, we find succor in diving into these narratives that, mm -hmm. that move us. Uh, now, the Expanse is also a super physical show. There's mm -hmm. a lot of fighting. There's a lot of zero gravity. How wait till you see season four, bro. Really? <laughs> because wait till you see season five. <laughs> I just watched the trailer in which you are getting ready to fight with a, a gentleman who I believe might be a villainous type. Someday I think you huh? and I are going to end up bloody. I'm free right now. All right, this is my first time <laughs> seeing that. And I'm just okay. wondering. Um, it's I don't know the context, really so that should be all right for me. to both act and emote and serve the character at the same time as you are literally, effectively, ballroom dancing with your fests, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right, yeah. Talk to him about how hard, how, how, what it's like to do stunt, detailed stunt work on wires and act. Well, you know, the, the, the thing, uh, doing stunts through Amos's perspective, um, it, it, it's, it's always a little bit more, so the way that we kind of design it is he's not, Amos is, he is a talented amateur. So we want it to be as brutal and as violent and sloppy as it could be. So it's not as choreographed. There's a lot of room for, you know, uh, per particularly there was something that we just did where it is the most primal, visceral, clawing, eyes, hair, stabbing that, you know, anything <laughs> I've ever done. And at the end of the day, you feel it because you know, you, you know, you, I didn't. You don't want it to like a, like a. It's not a kung fu scene. He's not a karate master. He's just a guy that has this you know ability to tolerate a lot of pain, and, and he's a, you know can be more violent than the next person. Hmm. Each new season brings new characters. That sounds uh, and uh, fascinating. Having spent a lot of time on these sets, I know what a family you guys are. How is it welcoming new people into the family every every season? That's one of my favorite things. My one of my favorite things is reading the beginning of a season reading the pilot or reading you know the, as many scripts as they have available yeah. and seeing all these new great characters and and thinking oh who are they going to cast for that <laughs> and then getting to meet all these people and it's like oh that was a good choice and then and then bringing them <laughs> into the family and you know making them feel welcome and making them feel at home and we've been so lucky particularly in season four and this season five of getting such talented people to come be a part of the show Would and, he and ever work admit with us. Otherwise? Just, I just feel lucky <laughs> that we get to work with all these people. You know, when I watch scenes between you and other actors, specifically where there's activation, or the, the hint of violence, I start to think to myself that for you and the scene partner you're with, there must be a moment when you both are to know that this one, this take, is clicking mm. on all cylinders. Does that <laughs> feel as good as I hope it does? It really yeah. does. It really does. I think uh, I had a scene in season four where uh, I was with uh, another character um, and in that character we have a disagreement and there is a punch in that scene and Withholding. we were so into <laughs> it and so caught up into it just that guessing. that character ended up punching me <laughs> in the face <laughs> and the thing is is because it happens in the scene and the thing is I didn't in we finished the scene and it felt great and I didn't realize until they told me after like are you okay and I said why they go, you really got punched in the face and I and I it just felt so natural in the scene and doing that and he's like I'm so sorry I'm so sorry I'm like what are you talking about that's like one of the best takes we've ever had <laughs> you know it really really worked because I was so connected and so into it and that happened um, yeah, so it'd be interesting to see if you can tell what scene it is. I can't <laughs> wait. Um, huh. How important well, is it also, bruise? over this period of time, I assume your crew has remained mostly the same. Yeah. Um, that's got to make it a very comfortable atmosphere to sort of step outside your comfort zone. Yeah, and, and it's rare. So, I th you know, we've had the probably 95% of the original crew <sighs> five years ago. We that's started, th crazy. we're going in our fifth year. I had a son. 
Um, my son was born uh, the second, the third week of shooting, the first season. He turns five next week. Yeah, that's cool. It's five years. Right. You know, I'm like, how did, what? <laughs> um, but so to go to what you say, you know, we've all been together for five years, all of us, you know, the crew, the people we work with and everything. And we've, you know, we have kids, people got married, you know, all these things. And so you become so connected and you have such relationship. And Steven and I were discussing this yesterday, but also working on a show that is demanding as this and all these moving parts, if you work together with somebody five years, you're gonna get good at what you're doing. Right. You're gonna have a connection and a relationship yeah. that you just know. A you shorthand. Know, a shorthand, shorthand yeah, and so everything. So when I show up on set here, I feel supported, I feel prepared, and I'm focused and ready to go. Sometimes you show up on a new set and it's like you have to meet everybody. The energy of like, hey, how you doing? Oh, nice yeah, to meet yeah. you, but you're trying to figure out what you're doing. This man, like we just, we, we've done it for so long that we just really locked into it. Well, I mean, it becomes part of your life and life has its ups and downs too. I would imagine that there are days you show up feeling a little less than ready for everything <laughs> right. and everyone else holds you up and helps you move forward. Yeah. Can't and imagine you know, what it's I'm like a, now I, with C-19 precautions uh, I'm an extrovert. Like I get my, really like, stringent you know, in Canada. talking to people and everything. So no matter how I feel, when I come and I see all my friends and people that I've been working with for a long time, that I feed off that energy and it gets me, yeah. it gets me up, you know, and it gets me going. And so there are days when I'm coming to work and it's like, oh man, I'm, you know, it's tired and on the scene and whatever. And then I show up and run into the, you know, as soon as you know, hey man, how you doing? Ah, and it's like, ah, and then you're just ready to start working. Were there any, uh, any props in season four that you got to interact with that were really fun? That were, uh... My favorite prop is the automatic shotgun. Yeah. I, you, you got to play with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really, really, um, oh, oh, there was, uh, we also, we have some new vehicles in season four that are really fun to drive. Oh, nice, yeah. like wheeled vehicles. The wheeled oh, vehicles. Wow. And they Actual have, cars? you know, and it's kind of controlled by a joystick. Yeah. You know, and it has these big, like, monster truck tires on them that goes over the rocks or whatever. And it's real, so it's you, practical. So you're it, yeah, well, no, it's practical, oh, it's real. Nice. It's goes literally, so you're rocks? like in a go-kart and, you, and you're and you you're laid back like this. Mars, you're I'm driving assuming? it like you would, you know, like the old Atari. <laughs> right, right. You know, like doing something like the old Atari. <laughs> you're driving it, but it has these big wheels and it's muddy and it's water, so <laughs> And you're driving, that was fun. That was a lot of fun driving that. I, I, you know, I love the show when you guys started. I love it so much more now. I can't wait for season four. Brother, All thank right. you so much. Thanks, brother. Coolio. Uh, I'm sure you noticed I got a little nervous because, like, I know many of you, well, I mean, these videos are recommended by club members primarily. And um, I have trust that, you know, there are no spoilers. Although there is nothing overtly spoilery, I did get some insight as to what to kind of expect in season four <laughs> and uh, season five, apparently. <laughs> uh, nothing major, obviously, you know, it's nothing major. But um, yeah, it gets me nervous. It gets me nervous. <laughs> but uh, okay, we're good. Uh, now, in terms of my thoughts about this video, it was nice to get some insight from Wes Chatham. Uh, the character of Amos for me, as I said, I've said it previously. It's it's a very mysterious character. I I actually am looking forward to see the the emotional development of this character. That's going to be really interesting, especially the way he's described. Uh, some of the the lights are going to be turned on a little bit there. The circuits, um, as he puts it in season four. So uh, yeah, yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Now, if any of you know of a similar type of interview, uh, for the actress who plays drummer, Kara G, I think. I'm terrible with names, but uh, if there's a similar non-spoiler, you know, anything, I don't, nothing related to season four or five, um, that you think I'd find interesting, that's at least under 20 minutes, preferably, uh, let me know. I'd really appreciate it. Leave it in the comments uh, for me. The Either the name of the actual video, which works best in the YouTube comments, um, or the link at my club, for those of you uh, just... Uh, yeah, leave that for me. I would love to see. I, I want to pick that, that actress's brain a little bit more. I, I love the character of Jar. Okay, all right. On to the next video we go. Okay, we are at video number three. This one is aptly titled uh, Boss Man Kamina Drummer, The Expanse for Belta Loda. <laughs> Belta Loda. Uh, this is from, uh, S I have to say this like three times to myself, Sefinity. Affinity. Looks simple to read, but <laughs> okay. So yeah, um, all about drummer. 
I am in love with this character. I just absolutely adore her. Okay, so this one is uh, two minutes and 59 seconds long. Three minutes, roughly, you know. And it's all about drama. So let's see what they have to show. Three, two, one, play. Oye, Beltalada, listen up. This is your captain. And this is your ship. This is your moment. You may think that you're scared, but you're not. That isn't fear. That's your sharpness. That's your power. Choice. I was really wondering what they were gonna pick. My people are dying, and I'm supposed to lay here and do nothing. I need you. Will you go? I got chills, man. Wow. Ashford! Shall I meet them on the dock with guns? We'll start with conversation. You cannot destroy the ring. Thank you for believing me. I'm not here for you. I think you can help get us out of this. She's there for Naomi. Naomi believes you're right. She would die for you. I mean, to make sure she doesn't. <laughs> I love that line. You saved my life because you are willing to die for a greater good. I still am. Oh, You just can't stop giving me advice, can you? Standing here is because of her. Yeah, damn right. <laughs> that's a great way to end it. Oh my gosh, that's so fantastic. Wow. Oh my goodness. You know what's funny? Like that song, Survivor from Destiny's Child, I hated it. Growing up, I hated it, especially when it was played over and over. I, st I still don't care for the song. But in the context and the, re the remix they chose and all that wonderful stuff. <laughs> on a technical level it just nails it with this drummer character and all the scenes that they beautifully edited wow bravo 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 whatever oh my gosh fantastic fantastic i want to watch it again but on my own time okay on to the next video okay so this video is titled the expanse kotiar gazi i hope that's how we say his name or gazi i'll say gazi for now uh, one Last Mission by Zurich, wonderful channel. So I'm excited to watch this one. This one is three minutes and 33 seconds, three, three, three. Let's go. Kotiar, one of my other favorite characters. Oh, well, I won't say favorite, but a character I really enjoy watching. And I miss him, I do. I miss him in the context of the Team ABC, you know? Yeah, okay, let's go. Three, two, one. Good to see you, Kotiar. Kotiar Ghazi, former SIG Int. What do you want? I want you on my security detail. Currently assigned to Deputy Undersecretary Avasarala security detail. You have skills which I thought might be useful someday. He's her spy. I don't have time to waste. I need a spy. Are you in or out? 
I need you to do something for me. Is this what I hope it is? I'm sure I'm going to love it. Right now, this is just a bad idea. That's a bad bet. I won't let you make it. Give it to me, please. But you hit send, and it's treason. Oh, I'm sure they'll hang us separately. You'll get a better view. So, what do you think? Say something to distract me. Why do you pretend that you care about my opinion? Indulge me. I don't like this whole setup. He could be playing you. That's a fucking trap. Oh, he was so predictable. The Greeks. Actually, be quiet. <clears throat> Let her win. Trust me. I am not a fragile flower. I'm running ops here. Understood? Not my first rodeo. You served. Take it. Back in the day. Uh, military intelligence. My IQ just too high to be a Marine. On the morals, he said low enough to be a spy. That's good training for politics. No wonder you ended up in her world. I should have got her son killed. I don't owe you anything. My son? Yes, your son. I failed my job on Sherman Paul died. I owe him, not you. If I have any value as a prisoner, I may use it to save your life. I've forgotten how it felt to be fighting for the good guys again. I like it. Mm. It's nice. They have such great chemistry together. So take control of this boat, how fast that safe. My oh, favorite oh, part. Help. Unless you have a better bad idea. This plan sucks. I'm not gonna totally disagree. Hey, hey, hey calm down, okay? It's gonna be okay. Nah, okay. You've done your planet a great service. And she says that to everyone. Let's go. Go. Ice water in my veins under pressure. Good job, Marine. That's why you hired me, right? Thank you, spy. So we'll be all right. It's gonna be okay. Okay. Abbasarama sent you a comms buffer. He said you're an honorable man. Yeah, he faded. This war was built on a lie. Are you gonna do something about it? The gold brought a molecule. It kills everything it touches. And it cannot be stopped. They're clear of the Agatha King. The ship is infected with a dangerous contagion. Your evac shuttle is ready. You need to go. Now. The only way to stop it for sure. Don't forget your antibiotics. A nuclear explosion. I won't. Naomi, I know that man. Did Kochar get out? I'm sure he did. Get him on your comms. I can talk him out of this stupidity. There's no talkback channel. He must have shut it off. He doesn't want to be found. I'm sorry. Well, Sharon Path. I guess that makes us even. I always thought I'd have something clever to say in this moment. Oh, something pithy. Even a little ironic, but memorable. I can't think of a fucking thing. Oh, well. I like a lot. Very good. Very good. I was thinking, you know, like, if they had made a spin-off show, with, you know, Team ABC, tell me in the comments, would you tune in? Because I know I'd be on board. Like, it's very rare you see that kind of chemistry with the uh, actors uh, playing those kinds of characters. Well, uh, I don't want to elaborate too much, but basically what I love between them is is what you see, is what we're, what, what everybody loves about them. Wow. I would totally watch a show, Team ABC, make it happen. <laughs> All right, next video. All right, we're down to video number five, and then two more to go. So this one is The Expanse cast reveal. The Expanse cast reveals their true selves from Amazon Prime Video, their official channel. Uh, yeah, so it seems to be like a mashup of um, behind the scenes and on camera kind of thing. Uh, looks fun, looks fun. So it's six minutes and eight seconds. Let's go, let's go. Three, two, one, play. So the biggest difference between me and my character, I think, is two things. What was she gonna say? Your ability to do math. <laughs> hey, I'm right. <laughs> I think Welcome to my world. Is that Naomi is very logical. Yes. Um, not. Your ship's a rust bucket, cobbled together with spare parts. That's my specialty. If you want to get out of here, she's logical and practical. People, I appreciate that about her. Oh, and also Naomi's stillness. Naomi is very still, and I'm not. I'm mm. always moving. I don't dancing. think I've ever seen you sit still. <laughs> no. I'm not, I'm not but Naomi is very like still. The biggest difference between my character and me is 
Like, I, I've never murdered anybody. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's the only biggest difference? <laughs> the biggest difference between Look my character her. and me is my voice. Oh my god. Oh, my voice? Don't you think? She's yeah, so she's chipper. Actually, yeah. Oh yeah. To Felt contrast, huh? Listen up. She, drummer never laughs. <laughs> Don't never laughs and I yeah, laugh all the time. Laughing. That's true. The biggest difference between me wow. and Alex is Alex has been through the military and uh, that is a whole different ball of wax. And you're an actor. And I'm an actor. <laughs> she's a marine, she's a she knows how to use guns. I'm Frankie I don't Anne. at all. I think I held one for the first time last season and had to ask like how to hold a gun. <laughs> I love her Kiwi <laughs> accent. She's so cute. <laughs> And the what about is, you? I'm very spontaneous. She's not. She's very methodical. Mm. Everything has to be pre-planned months it. before. I think the biggest similarity between me and my character is our struggle with injustice. I think that is a big thing that we share and what makes her conflicted a lot of the time. I'm not unsympathetic to the plight of Belters. I know the OPA doesn't speak for you all. Save your breath. We're not going to be friends. And also her struggles with her identity. I don't really struggle with mine, but there's also this, this to in and fro in that I've definitely experienced being mixed race. I, I'm really loyal for my friends and family. Loyal, but not to the point that Amos is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amos is yeah, a little too like, loyal. Well, I've murdered somebody for, for my family. Okay, let's yeah. just <laughs> okay. back in. Yeah. I think for me, the biggest similarities between me and Drummer, and it's funny because like no one ever really has to see this side of me because we're just like at work and mm -hmm. things are nice. But like when shit gets real, mm -hmm. I am badass. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Well, you have to have it in you to it's, you know to deliver that from, truth. Like, so I could totally buy that. Uh, I don't know. He was very worried when he heard you got shot. I had his name tattooed around the wound to remind. Me. I forgot how funny you are. <laughs> Alex is super family-oriented, caring about all the people around him. Are they going to show the other characters? Too. I want to see Prax. involved. He kind of gets lost in his own world. I kind of get like that, too. Never noticed. You never noticed that? <laughs> hey, Alex gets lost in his technology. I kind of do that, too. Show I get, you know, uh, the actors. Much, so. um, You're a lot like Alex. <laughs> me? <laughs> You're a lot like Alex. The biggest similarity between me and Mal. my character. You're both very political. Sadavir. They are in Sean Doyle. But no, they call me Blunty. I can't be a good politician if I'm blunty. What's that? <laughs> blunty. Mean? Means blunt, candid. Oh, I feel like that's exactly what we need. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both don't like to let people down, and we're both family checker in us. We go in, we check on our friends' parents, we say hi. Mm -hmm. We're also their favorite friend. Mm -hmm. Who's most like their character on the show? I think you might be one of the people. I could see most that. Like their I could totally see the person that. Person who's most like their character is. Cass. Yeah, I would say Cass is Cass most is like most Alex like... Kumar. Cass. It's Cass. 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 <laughs> then it definitely is Cass. Cass. <laughs> He's it. I mean, it's like a great dress tailored for him only. Yeah, I think they have a similar enthusiasm for the things that they're mm. passionate about. Whenever we go Cooking out and, flying? and uh, have dinner or whatever as a, as a cast, we always fall into our roles as like people going for dinner. Dom always takes over and decides where we're gonna eat. Yep. And I'm always like easy cheesy, I don't care as long as the food's good. And Wes is like <laughs> off in dreamland and he just kinda like tags along, we gotta kinda like grab him. You like and, catch him staring off. And, and Steven it's just like, Steven just makes sure everything's okay. But Steven, where is he at? We're, we're very much we're very much like the Rossi crew when we're going out. Yeah. And I think the person who's least like their character is What do you think about? Karen drummer. Yeah. Well, it's funny because whenever anyone meets Karen in real life, they're like, who do you play on the show? You and Frankie, however, like- I, I would never believe she plays drummer too. To you, but when we're out, you're the biggest, laughiest, funniest, <laughs> goofiest people that we just never see on camera. Yeah, we never That's get cool. to see that. I think drummer has smiled one time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would say Wes is the least like his character mm -hmm. because Wes, is a hard one to figure out because he looks like a hard person, but he's actually a huge teddy bear. And I think that Amos man. is like a sociopath, and that's not what Wes is like at all. If I meet somebody in town, usually and they're like, "Hey, we're a fan of your show," and I say, "Oh, thank you," and I go to shake their hand, they're like, "Oh my god, wait, <laughs> you're smiling! Like you are not like Amos at yeah, all." People always yeah. remark when they see you smile. Yeah, right? and they say, like, see you smile. smiling. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's acting, laughing. guys. 
Lots of laughs and smiles. That's, <laughs> that's the biggest thing about it. That's this. true. Thanks so much for watching. For more bonus content with us, subscribe to Amazon Prime Video on YouTube. All right. That was really cool. It's wow. Kara G is really, really giddy giddy. Um, I wanted to see other actors. Wee. Yeah, I'm not going to take any chances with other interviews until I'm all caught up. But uh, that was a nice insight. Nice insight to see uh, how some of them think, uh, how they compare themselves. Yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else. No, not really. I'll look forward to watching, obviously, more of that kind of video, uh, these kinds of videos, as you know, as soon as I'm caught up. I'm probably going to binge watch a bunch of them. <laughs> okay, speaking of binge watch, all right, so we are almost finished. I am now going to move on to probably the most anticipated video you're all waiting to see me react to. Coming. All right, video number six. This one is ta -da! The Crack Part 2 for The Expanse from Yan Hira. So how hard am I going to laugh? Let's find out or, or cry or who knows what. All I know is Crack 1 was freaking hilarious and I cannot wait to see for Crack 2. Uh, keep in mind, though, that it is possible for YouTube, um, I may have to silence some of the songs, song choices. Unfortunately, that's the way it works. Um, otherwise, I won't be able to play the video for you for copyright reasons. Uh, hence why you should be joining my club. So you have, uh, so there's no restrictions for you to watch what I watch. Okay, let's go. Uh, three. Two, one, play. Previously on the expanse. Shit, 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 shit. We're more or less fucked. <laughs> there we go. So you're in charge around here, is that fair to say? Absolutely. I'm the boss. Okay, so take us through a day in the life of the boss. Well, the first thing <laughs> to do is... Dr. Corbett, approve memos! <laughs> Read a workshop! Remember birthdays! Direct workflow! My own bathroom! Micromanage! Promote synergy! That is perfect! Hit on Deborah. Get rejected! Swallow sadness! <laughs> Swallow faces. sadness! Call right at that line. clip! Okay, well, this has been eye-opening for me. I'm the boss. Yeah, no, I got that. You said it about 400 times. I'm the boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm the boss. <laughs> oh, I heard you. See you later. That's good. There you go. Now you just walk around like you're in pumps. How do you know what it's like to walk in pumps? I didn't know. I always work in space. <laughs> <laughs> With that one was good. stroke, create an ultra intense look. Whoa, whoa. New blockbuster liner from L'Oreal. Our first liner with a thick marker tip. Create bold oh. lines instantly. That's quite fitting. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to see L'Oreal differently now. Tell my CEO to a UN and admiral in the middle of a war. Yes, exactly. Okay. I can see what's happening. What? And they don't have a clue. Who? <laughs> They'll fall in love, and here's the bottom line: our trio's One down to two. two. Oh. <laughs> that was good too. Surprise, bitch! I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. Shot Talk dirty to me. We call oh. you and then gunship to I save your you. heart. I the Can you just settle down now, darling, please? Call me darling again and you'll be saying that drawl in sign language. <laughs> oh my god. She's so hot. <laughs> She's so flippin' hot. Well, they're just like friends though. 
I want to tell her how hot she is, but she'll think I'm being sexist. She's so hot, she's making me sexist. <laughs> Bitch. I'm so happy. I didn't like how they ended I love that. You so much. Babe, don't be a pussy. <laughs> that song choice for that moment because you will get pregnant and die don't have sex in the missionary position don't have sex standing up <laughs> just don't do it promise okay buddy you're a boy make a big nice thing in the street gonna be a big man someday you got mad yeah this fits this fits big disgrace kicking your can all over the place singing we yeah, this totally fits. I thought I think a lot of songs like this would fit this scene. I see dead people. Oh my god. Oh my god. Have you got a gay? Go. Go, I've gotta go. Do you wanna build a snowman? Okay. <laughs> Let's get wet. I'm bringing sexy back. The motherfuckers don't know how to act. Yeah. Woo. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. <laughs> get on your knees. Get on your knees. Get on your knees. Is there anything better than pussy? Yes, a really good book. <laughs> okay. Here's, Here's Johnny. Yeah. I was walking through the city streets, and a man walks up to me and hands me the latest energy drink. Run faster, jump higher. Man, I'm not gonna let you poison me. I threw it on the ground. Many things to throw on the ground, like this and this and that and even this. <laughs> oh gosh! I've killed better people than Telly Faggotty. He was approves. Okay. This is a bit better. Another one bites the dust. That's good. This is good. Another one bites the dust. And another one fell. And another one fell. Another one bites the dust. Oh. I fucking hate space. <laughs> That's okay. They made up for it with the way they ended this video. Not bad, not bad. Um, not as good as I wanted it to be. But uh, not terrible. Uh, some of the song choices I, I, I couldn't resonate with. Um, but hey, I watched it. But if I had to pick, Crack 1 is way better. Way better. Okay. Hopefully if there's a Crack... I don't know. The, is there a Crack 3? I guess for seasons 4 or 5? Let me know. I, I guess when the time comes, I will watch that one, right? All right, let's move on to the last video that I hope most of you will be, will dig or maybe you've seen it before, I don't know. But here he comes. Okay, so it's down to the last video that I have selected and this one is called Why the Expanse is Awesome, season three spoilers by a channel called Rowan J. Coleman. Um, this one I found on my own. I took a chance in the way I, I did my search without uh, being spoiled by thumbnails and stuff. And it came up just perfect for me. And um, 
yeah, maybe some of you have seen this already. Uh, I guess you'll let me know in the comments. But let's see why this person feels that uh, The Expanse is awesome. And I'm sure I'll concur with 99.9%. <laughs> not 100, not 100, no. <laughs> All right, let's see. Countdown to play. Three, two, one, play. This video is brought to you by my university degree. I have one now. When I read I like the expanse already. had been cancelled, my heart sank. Especially because this was only a day after Brooklyn Nine Nine was originally cancelled. Oh, but just as the Brooklyn Nine Nine, Nine was revived, I jumped with joy when I learned that Amazon had picked up the expanse for season four. I thought for a terrifying I moment cried that my Brooklyn video Nine -Nine on the expanse would be a love letter to a show which went before its time, but now it is far more optimistic. The Expanse, based on a series of novels by James S. A. Corey, a duo of writers Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, premiered on the Sci-Fi Channel in 2015 and since then it has become one of the most acclaimed sci-fi shows since the Battlestar Galactica reboot. If you still haven't seen it yet, let me give you some reasons to watch it. The first striking thing about The Expanse as a series is how it often uses the limitations which other franchises sidestep as strengths rather than weaknesses. Instead of taking place across a galaxy or far off alien worlds, The Expanse remains confined to our own solar system, and yet it manages to feel just as rich and alluring as any intergalactic space opera. The future depicted in The Expanse shows humanity divided into three distinct factions. The wealthy, prosperous Earthers, the driven and unified Martians, and the often exploited Belters. Each faction with their own distinct heritage and culture, instantly recognisable in broad strokes, yet fascinating in the easy to miss details. The Belters especially appearing the most alien, for lack of a better word. Their own unique dialect and signing language developed from the early days of their colonies, where space-suited workers had to communicate using abbreviated words and hand gestures in order to conserve oxygen. The little details like that explained in depth in novels effortlessly portrayed on screen in a visual storytelling sense. The universe as a whole is constructed with an eye for detail which is incredibly impressive. The Expanse is built from the ground up, providing a truly cohesive and imaginative canvas for stories to be told and characters to inhabit. It's this cohesion in the universe which informs all other aspects of the story, namely the characters. Being divided between different, often hostile factions organically creates great character drama throughout the show, especially for the central cast, a ragtag group of underdogs from Earth, Mars and the Belt. As we are led around the solar system and witness the wider conflicts unfolding, so too do the personal clashes between our favourite main characters, neither being especially right or wrong. It's a similar trick used in the writing for Farscape, where the relationships between the main characters informed on the larger galactic conflict. However, here it's flipped. This time it's used as an effective device to make the weight of the solar system feel like it's bearing down on our protagonists, making their mistakes and impulsive decision making come from a place of desperation, escalating the tension and emotion of each storyline. The characters themselves are all played to perfection, bringing memorable personalities to life with charismatic and memorable performances. Even more minor supporting characters become fan favourites in a surprisingly Come short here. amount of screen time. A large ensemble with the same depth and development as the ensemble in the likes of Game of Thrones. That Game of Thrones comparison isn't hyperbole either, as the two shows do share several things in common. The old George R. R. Martin chestnut of establishing what the absolute worst case scenario for the plot would be, and then following through on that idea. The larger conflicts are given a tense edge thanks to this writing trick, but also because of the adherence to more realistic space physics. It's a common trope to hand wave away many of the real life imitations of space travel, with technologies like gravity plating or inertial dampeners and a myriad of other devices which, let's be fair, are pretty much magic. The Expanse on the other hand embraces these physics puzzles to simultaneously enrich the world, create spectacular visuals and throw out dramatic obstacles. Rather than the shaky cam generated battle hits, bullets and railgun projectiles rip through the interiors of spaceships. Rather than the inexplicable dependency of constant gravity, the Expanse uses g-force and inertia to make it that much harder for our protagonists to survive their already difficult encounters. It also helps to an enormous degree just how well this show is able to depict these worlds and their conflicts with an absolutely stellar production all around. Part of sci-fi's reason for originally cancelling The Expanse was no doubt the cost of the show's production, but for what's being spent, mm. Every scent is on screen, from District 9 composer Clinton Shorter's truly amazing score to the outstanding VFX and the gorgeous production design. The high quality of the production has it standing head and shoulders above most of the competition. The plethora of intricately designed ships to the breathtaking scenic vistas, all of it beautifully rendered and subsequently disturbed with a truly alien encroaches on the plot. 
For all my talk of solar system wide conflicts and personal clashes, the element which will hold viewers in place from sheer curiosity is the introduction and exploration of the extrasolar proto molecule. While the White Walkers have been to Game of Thrones, confrontation with the unknown and the incomprehensibly advanced demonstrates limitless possibilities for where the story could go. No doubt True. book readers are ahead of me on this one, but once again, the way in which this plot thread is depicted in the series is borderline genius. Such hard work has gone into the realistic depiction of space physics and the biological results of living on different worlds that when the proto molecule starts doing its thing, the breaking of these hardwired rules is just as shocking and strange to the viewers as it is to the characters. The Expanse has delivered a gripping drama of corruption, economic disparity, ideological clashes, and ordinary people caught up in extraordinary circumstances. A rich fictional universe that feels cohesive and developed, informing on the characters, their struggles, and larger emotional conflicts of the story. Delivered to the screen with highest production quality money can buy and filmmakers can imagine. And now the future of the show looks set to capitalize on this by putting ordinary people at even more incredible and unbelievable events unfolding before them. The Expanse is only three seasons in, but it has already cemented itself as a science fiction classic, which should be watched and adored by fans of the genre the world over. For all those reasons and no doubt more which will be unveiled in the future, that is why The Expanse is awesome. Ah, oh, well said, well done. Thank you for watching. Well done, yeah. I thought it was a great video. Let me know in the comments what you thought of that video, if, this is, if that was your first time watching it. Oh, good video. Um, I was realizing too, like when he mentioned the proto molecule is akin to the White Walkers from Game of Thrones. Uh, I the first thought that went through my head when he said that was yes, totally true on the surface. But for me, I know if the proto molecule wasn't in it, I'd still be watching the show because the characters are so good and so well developed, and the um the narrative, all the other narratives aside from the proto molecule, I feel is is still compelling enough for me to watch it. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to wrap up my thoughts overall in a minute. So there you have it. That's my reaction to these seven videos. Let me know in the comments which uh, video that I've put up that you were really curious to see my reaction to, which one perhaps surprised you in terms of my reaction, or maybe didn't surprise you. Maybe you knew I was going to have the reaction that you saw. <laughs> I'm curious. Let me know either way. Now, when it comes to watching these kinds of videos behind the scenes or fan-made stuff, um, I have to be very careful for spoilers, especially with season four coming up that I'll be watching and reacting to in the next few days by the time you watch this video. And so I'm going to hold off, you know, put the brakes on watching any other additional videos you may suggest in the comment section until perhaps after season four. And you best know that by the time I catch up to where you're all at, I think it's season six now or... Or they just wrapped up season six, someone told me, and it's going to air sometime soon. <laughs> Either way, I'm saving my serial binge watching of all things Expanse to when I catch up completely with the whole series. Now, as for the books related to the Expanse, I am putting that on my to read list. I have quite a long list of things to read. And one of my club members has recommended actually listening to the audiobooks. Now, I'll say right off the bat, when it comes to reading books or audiobooks in general, I'm very picky. My priority for us are fantasy books, then science fiction, then nonfiction. And right now, I'm actually rereading the Wheel of Time book series by Robert Jordan. I'm a huge fan of Robert Jordan. And uh, with the Amazon show coming up soon, I'm actually uh, kind of touching up on my notes about the Wheel of Time. So once I'm done my reread of those books, I will likely move on to reading the books related to The Expanse. I uh, probably might start with the audiobook and see how I feel with that. But I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not too keen on audiobooks in general. I kind of like to have the book in my hand and smell the pages and bookmark it and all that stuff and write my notes on there. So I'll likely get the physical book. But either way, I will eventually indulge in the Expanse books because I have a feeling I'm going to really enjoy them. In any case, if you enjoyed this video, the best way that you can let me know is by following those prompts you see there at the bottom right corner of your screen right over here yes indeed thank you all so much for watching and thank you all for your support of my channel and my reactions to the expanse so until my reaction to episode one of the fourth season i am tuning out Bye bye everyone peace thanks for watching check out my other videos and subscribe you know you wanna